All right. Okay, welcome everybody to the wet today's webinar, Inclusive Mobility Enabling the Participation of Older Adults and People with Disabilities. My name is Carrie Diamond. I'm a Training and Technical Assistance Specialist uh, for Easter Seals with the National Aging and Disability Resource Center. Uh, before we get to our presenters today, I'd like to um, just give a brief overview of the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. Um, one of the two hosts for this webinar today and the Shared Use Mobility Center, uh, Al will talk about that shortly. The NADTC was launched in December of 2015 and it is a partnership between the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging or N4A and Easter Seals. It builds on the earlier work of the National Center for, on Senior Transportation and Easter Seals Project Action. For those of you who have been around in the network long enough, you'll remember the good work of those two centers that have now combined into the NADTC. Overall, our mission is to promote the availability and accessibility of transportation options that serve the needs of older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers. So, first off, I would like to introduce our moderator. So, Steve Yaffe is an Easter Seals con contractor, uh, works with the NADTC, has a vast experience uh, operating and uh, knowing all about human services and Americans with Disabilities Act uh, transportation as well as fixed route bus. So, Steve, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Well, thank you. Um... Transit is a family of services. That's why I've got a tree in the middle. Many, are connect, many of these services are connected like branches on a tree. So you see pictured here are a variety of shared ride modes, an accessible transit bus, shuttles, neighborhood-based microtransit, taxi, volunteer services, and bike share, including the three-wheeler on the right. Some may ride on just one of these modes to reach destinations, However, transit is changing. Plus resources are being concentrated on fixed routes to connect high intensity land uses. That leaves those living and working in the suburbs to uh, other options. They may walk, they may ride, they may bike to hubs where they can transfer to and from bus or train to complete their trips. Uh, next slide. Uh, so transit is in revolution uh, with new technologies and practices transforming what we do and how we pay for these rides. These successful uh, innovations are based on inclusive planning and partnerships. Inclusive planning and community engagement produces solutions that meet a wide variety of needs. I mean, one of the slogans I frequently use is nothing gets done except in partnerships that's sustainable. The picture on the left margin is from an NADTC funded mobility planning project for rural Larimer County, Colorado outside Fort Collins. They, uh, they fostered collaborations reflecting the demographics of the community as well as public health. Faith-based human service agencies and other perspectives lead to efficient solutions addressing food deserts, rides to the doctor, rides to work. Those who could ride transit but need instruction can get that using travel training as shown in the center top picture. From, uh, that's from Via Mobility in Boulder. With coordinated technology for information and scheduling, those traveling in the same direction at the same time, but having, having different funding can share the ride. New software has improved the efficiency of volunteer provided rides. Funding options are changing as well. Uh, Medicare Advantage, for example, has joined Medicaid in paying for rides to and from medical and rehab services. Some medical, Medicare Advantage programs will pay for rides to uh, grocery stores and uh, opportunities for exercise. We're seeing innovations in urban, suburban, and rural settings. And NADTC has uh, been proud to help foster stu uh, planning studies to improve transportation in all these areas. So uh, we're looking forward to this. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what we're looking for, uh, working towards is inclusive mobility in the emerging shared ride network. I picked a couple of quotes that I think are Ill illustrative of what we're doing. First one is from James Charlton, who is a disability rights activist. Nothing about us without us. And for those who work with Centers for Independent Living, you're all familiar with that slogan. In other words, don't plan a, a program for somebody, for a group of people, unless you consult with, a, with that group of people to see what their needs are and how it'll work. Um, sometimes if you meet me in a future where we can actually go to a conference, I've got some more stories about mistakes that occurred when we tried to do that. The other quote is from Steve Jobs, design is not just what it looks like and feels like, design is how it works. And I think uh, SUMC has, been, has pioneered those connections. How does it work in various aspects of the shared mobility uh, world? So Mitch LaRosa is going to give us a, a, a presentation on inclusive shared mobility, enabling the participation of older adults and people with disabilities nothing about us without us. And Al Benedict is gonna give an overview of, SU, uh, of SUMC's work with accessible shared mobility and mobility as a service. Um, let me introduce Mitch. He's a program director at Shared Mobility Inc. He leads the development and implementation of new mobility initiatives, working closely with project stakeholders to coordinate transportation solutions. His work is focused nationwide, primarily in Western New York and California San Joaquin Valley. Mitch has extensive experience working with public, private, and nonprofit entities to foster cross collaboration with the team's projects. He oversees shared mobility's innovative programs, such as the launch of new bike sharing programs in underserved communities research to make shared mobility more inclusive for older adults and people with disabilities, and creating shared transportation options for rural communities. His work with uh, NATTC began in 2018 with research on how increasing inclusivity in shared uh, transportation programs can aid in the implementation of successful programs. And since then, Mitch has worked with SMI's partners to implement these findings including the launch of new volunteer transportation program. He's a graduate of the University of Buffalo's Master of Urban, of Urban Plan, Planning program. Take it away, Mitch. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks so much, Carrie, as well, for the introductions. Uh, Steve, I really appreciated the quote there. And if you all have not had a chance to attend a conference with Steve Yaffe, I really implore you to do so at some point in the future. Uh, hearing your story, Steve, is always really great. So. Uh, I appreciate the nice shout out and the kind words for uh, the bio here. So uh, as they mentioned, my name is Mitch LaRosa. I am the program director here at Shared Mobility. Uh, a little background on us. We started in 2009 as Buffalo Car Share, which is the nation's first social equity focused shared mobility program. Uh, we operated car sharing here in Buffalo for about six years before we transitioned that program to Zipcar. And in the time since, we've transitioned ourselves to be not only focused on Western New York and just car sharing, but elevate our work to be more nationwide focused and more focused on shared mobility options all around. So we've had a lot of great opportunities to do new research on innovative programs and trying to push the limits of shared mobility programs uh, across the nation. So uh, as Steve mentioned, we started our work with NADTC back in 2018 with some of the research I'm gonna take you through today. And we've been really fortunate to continue that work up until now. So um, next slide, please, Carrie. So just as a little agenda here, I think uh, I'll take you through some of the background in our own research that we outlined with NADTC. Uh, we'll get into some of the recommendations that I think are really critical for everyone here to think about on how to make shared mobility programs more inclusive. And uh, I'll wrap it up with some of the work that we're doing right now that we're actually putting a lot of these findings into action nationwide. And it's some of the more interesting outputs of our work and how we're carrying this torch forward. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. So rewinding to 2018 when we started this project, uh, we came to NADTC with a problem that we had identified, is that as shared mobility was becoming more mainstream, as these programs are growing, they were scaling, large companies like Uber, Lyft, Lime, et cetera, were, were taking over the marketplace. 
no one was really focusing on inclusivity and there were a lot of populations being left behind namely older adults and people with disabilities these new programs were growing these devices were hitting the streets uh, and there wasn't a big focus on making sure that all communities could be served so we felt that it was our role as a nonprofit that wanted to push these envelopes and, and continue to develop new solutions that this was the right time to jump into this research and try to figure out how we can examine uh, the industry piece by piece to figure out what we can do to make it better. So we chose to focus on four segments of shared mobility, ride hailing, car sharing, bike sharing, and uh, volunteer transportation, which isn't traditionally considered part of the shared mobility suite, but uh, I'll get into that later on why we think that's really important to consider here. So we tried to take a holistic approach, uh, look at all options from all angles, and we did, uh, so you know, we worked through that process as, as we went along. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. So our methodology for this and how we, uh, we went about it. Uh, we partnered with the University of Buffalo's Center for Inclusive Design, and they call it the IDEA Center. And uh, one slide back, Carrie. Thanks. Uh, so we partnered with the IDEA Center at the University of Buffalo to uh, figure out how we can uh, actually get in, in front of folks from these communities in Buffalo, work on some uh, focus groups, and develop a research methodology around that. So the IDEA Center is a great program that the University of Buffalo incubates. Uh, they were very supportive during this process, and they were a great partner to have throughout our work. Um, so with that, as you see in the picture here, we hosted a few tar uh, focus groups with our target population. And we brought in folks with uh, hearing impairments, visual uh, um, uh, impairments, and uh, folks who really needed uh, to have their voice heard on these issues. So we tried to do our best to include a diverse set of voices from these communities. And uh, we thought we did a good job of that over the series of focus groups throughout early 2019. Uh, additionally, we convened a steering committee uh, of folks uh, from our local area who really had a lot to say on this and could give some direct impact and feedback to these programs. And then we, just the same, we went across the country and did a bit of a sweep on other programs that had uh, done innovative things in this space and had implemented new ideas to their programs that we could look at it and find best practices nationwide. So we try to take a holistic process here. Uh, we really try to put people first in this process. And we think we did a, a good job of that. And we got some really, really interesting feedback from folks as we went about this process. So uh, it was great to have a, a more ground up approach to this research and uh, we really felt that the findings we had were critical to how to move some of these uh, some of these ideas forward. Uh, next slide please Carrie. So within that we really identified four key barriers to uh, older adults and people with disabilities and uh, sought to kind of look at options that were within these four buckets. Uh, so physical, economic, geographic, and operational barriers. Uh, physical barriers are fairly obvious you know if you are a, wheel a wheelchair user and uh, a ride hailing vehicle comes that's not accessible to you, you physically cannot you know, get into the vehicle. Uh, and there are other options around that, such as you know, standard bikes are not for everyone, et cetera. That was a fairly obvious barrier and we knew it was one of the four. Uh, economic was key. You know, we found that a lot of folks in these populations didn't have the means to pay for all the trip options in, in the shared mobility suite and that there was a disconnect between the pricing of these new options that could really help extend their mobility and the actual financial reality for folks uh, out in the field. Um, geographic, you know, we really did focus on a lot of uh, rural populations, extant suburban populations, um, and how the not all these shared mobility programs really reach folks out that way. Uh, so there was major gaps in direct access to programming in the shared mobility space. So that was uh, our third barrier. And sort of the fourth barrier and maybe the most um, unique and the most hard to pin down was, was operational. And it really boils down to that not every shared mobility program is focused on serving everyone and especially not older adults and people with disabilities, which can be a very unique population to serve. So we found that there was just a lot of institutional barriers and programs that didn't have their staff, their model and everything else focused on serving everyone. So, these are the four primary barriers we, we came to, to focus on. And following that identification, we sought to go through and identify specific recommendations we can make for these types of programs to move forward. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. And you, you can just go again, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so one, the one grouping here is just overall recommendations for all shared mobility programs. And three we came up with were targeted education and outreach, co-locations of services around the target population, 
and subsidies for shared mobility users. Um, you know, it is unclear how to overcome all these barriers, and I'll, I'll preface that as I go through these, but we are, we're committed to doing this through our work. So education outreach is really important both for the operators of these systems and for potential users. Uh, we got a picture here of our CEO, Mike Galagano, who is uh, talking with some folks from a, uh, a local nursing facility about uh, using car share cars that we had deployed at their facility in the city of Buffalo. And not all of them had, had heard of this type of programming when we had done focus groups. Not all of our um, attendees were aware of all of the programs that were available through shared mobility options. So, you know, being if you're a program that serves your community, having the ability to do this type of outreach to different uh, focus groups and different target populations can definitely help expand the knowledge base of folks locally and in sort of serves as a sort of travel training that you see with a lot of transit programs. So we felt that was key to align. The second two with co-location and subsidies, uh, I had mentioned in some of the barriers here. Um, if you live in a, if you don't live in the core portion of a lot of small and mid-sized cities, uh, these programs either don't exist in your area or, or just are not exist in the region at all. And even if they do, uh, especially with ride hailing, we found a big disconnect between the price people were able to pay for a ride and the price offered by ride hailing services to, to get from point to point. So. We heard a lot of folks who thought that these programs could really expand their community mobility, make them more active and, and allow them to access more services. But unfortunately, they were not able to based on the current price point of that. So we felt if there was a way to address that, subsidies could be a way to, to go about that. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. Um, so for bike sharing, uh, two major recommendations we found were adding adaptive bikes to your system. Uh, this picture up top is from MoGo in Detroit. They're a great bike sharing program really focused on getting all populations involved through their work. So their suite of different adaptive bikes uh, is really critical because there are, there's different bikes for different folks. Uh, everyone has a different physical need and there really isn't one specific uh, sort of adaptive bike you can deploy at all stations to give people that access. Uh, so offering a diverse set of these bikes was a really great way for MoGo to get more people involved and we profiled them in, in our research. Uh, electric assist bikes as well provide the same thing. Uh, as people age, uh, electric assist bikes can help people ride longer, ride for more time, ride for more distance, and it's a way to keep people active while taking away some of the physical strain of, the, of biking. And it's a really adaptive technology. You can even, there are even examples where they can combine electric assist and adaptive bikes together, but uh, both we found were very helpful for these populations to, to move forward with. Next slide, please, Carrie. In car sharing, uh, two ideas we ran with were dedicated drivers for car share members. Uh, not everyone is physically able to drive the car themselves, but a lot of folks have friends, family, and, and support around them that can help accentuate that mobility, but not all those partners have a vehicle that people can access. So um, by integrating wheelchair accessible vehicles in the second point here and allowing dedicated drivers is, is sort of a great one-two punch on getting more people involved with car sharing programs and expanding their ability to uh, give access to people. So uh, we had profiled CarShare Atlantic up in Canada and uh, a program out in the Bay Area in San Francisco that had done some of these items. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. Uh, in ride hailing, uh, you know, wheelchair accessible vehicle policies for TNC operators was very key. Uh, major cities like the city of Chicago, Washington, San Francisco, and a very small handful of others had implemented these policies where if TNCs wanted to operate in the city, uh, they needed to provide wheelchair accessible vehicles for populations. Uh, unfortunately, not every city, especially the small and mid-sized cities that we work with, have this type of political and social clout to demand this type of uh, regulation, uh, where TNCs may just simply pull out of the market if they, if they were encumbered with that in their words. But uh, we felt it was still a very strong way from a municipal level to lead uh, accessibility and put that really forthright in how we make, we make mobility decisions. So. Uh, even though there's a small handful of cities right now that have those policies, it is still had a very positive effect for populations there. And we think that replicating that model elsewhere is key. And, you know, enhanced driver training practices is always good. Uh, a lot of folks in the focus group really thought that their Uber and Lyft drivers didn't quite have a good handle on how to work with them as uh, a person with a disability or an older adult, not knowing how to communicate or um, really, you know, handle the interaction. And, and they made them as a user feel uncomfortable. So, uh, we really feel that there is a lot of room to work with there with uh, 
enhancing these driver training practices, just like enhancing um, training practices for any program would be good. Uh, so overall, these are recommendations for, for these types of programs. Uh, next slide, please, Carrie. And then lastly, um, so volunteer transportation programs, uh, you know, this, when we focused on rural areas, we didn't have a lot of good conventional options uh, that would help enhance people's mobility. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's, it's difficult to launch a, a bike share program, uh, nearly impossible for a bike share program and very difficult for car share programs to really work in rural areas. So we try to think outside the box on what is a shared transportation option in general that can help these populations. And volunteer transportation programs were a really great way to do that. Uh, they're low cost generally for communities and the users. They're, they can focus on older adults and people with disabilities. And they're a pretty versatile program model. You can adapt them in any, any singular way you want to. So in terms of shared mobility options for rural and, and extant suburban communities, we thought this was a strong, uh, just implementing these programs was a really strong way to help increase that accessibility. And next slide, please, Gary. So with all those recommendations in mind, and I know that was a lot, I, I certainly ran through those 10 uh, kind of quickly, but uh, I'd like to focus on just three things, you know, that we're working on right now in our project suite that is helping to put these ideas into action because it's really critical for us when we were thinking about these programs on how you know we can do this research we want to do this examination and, and be very thorough but it would it wouldn't be meaningful unless we took that to our partners try to incorporate these meetings and our programs and actually work to push these models forward so um next slide please carrie the most direct impact and output rather of this uh, NADTC grant in 2018 was a, a subsequent grant in 2019 that actually allowed us to launch our own volunteer transportation system in Western New York State. Uh, we partnered with a group called the Volunteer Transportation Center up in Watertown and they had been doing this work for 25 years so they're up in the green if you look at the New York State map up in the top corner. Um, so we worked with them to replicate their model in rural Erie County and now across Western New York with support from the FTA. They've been a great partner and it's helped add to our own uh, program suite and how we can offer more shared mobility programs across the region. So this program is still getting off the ground. Uh, we've been working on it with NADTC and now the FTA through this year. And we're gonna continue to work on this program to make sure it grows and uh, gets up to scale. Uh, so it's uh, been a great way uh, to show the support for our community and a great way to continue to increase mobility options for everyone. Next slide, please, Carrie. Uh, secondly, we have the Meal Car Car Sharing Program that we are working on with our partners at Mobility Development out in California. Uh, so Meal Car is a 27 car electric uh, shared fleet in the San Joaquin Valley, south of uh, Fresno, that is offering folks um, very accessible and very equitably priced options to uh, shared vehicles at low income housing facilities across the region. Uh, with support from the California Air Resources Board and the US Department of Energy, we've been able to expand the program. And we're actually considering options to incorporate a volunteer transportation aspect to this as well. So this community has been very supportive of this program and it's a really critical way for us to give back. It's the world's largest rural uh, car sharing program. And so it's been a great way for us to implement more options on co-location of services. You know, these are populations who don't have any other transportation options and ways to work on different community outreach. So it's been a, a great way to work uh, these options into our program so far. And with this possible volunteer transportation integration, we can actually take this further. Next slide, please, Carrie. Uh, but the last thing I wanna talk about and I wanna talk about a little bit more in depth is related to our, um, uh, the point about e-bikes and how that can help older adults and people with disabilities increase their mobility. Uh, fortunately, we were just awarded a donation from Uber of 3,000 X jump bikes uh, as they transferred their jump division to Lyme. So, We've just received this very large donation of e-bikes uh, and our goal is to create access for dis transportation disadvantaged communities. And that includes people with disabilities, that includes older adults and disadvantaged communities nationwide. So we have a very broad goal and we wanna give these bikes back to communities and create more access through this program. Um, we're gonna use them as a basis for what we're terming transportation libraries as a way to give people free access to these bikes. Um, the operation model is still coming into focus. Uh, we actually just unloaded the last truckload of these bikes yesterday morning. So we have uh, finally uh, gotten the whole donation together and we're moving forward with that now. So uh, our goal is to form these transportation libraries and we have a few partners in mind, but there will be a, a, a large chunk of these bikes remaining that we don't actually have assigned to projects right now. So um, we are going to issue a national RFI, sort of a call to partners nationwide 
Um, so people can get in touch with us uh, and we can work out where we think that these bikes will work best in the nation. And we want to hear from folks like you. Uh, so we got everyone on the webinar today is certainly interested in these topics. And if you feel that you're passionate about this, uh, your community has uh, something to give back to these bikes and you know, we think there'll be some partnership here, I encourage you, uh, my email is on the next slide, please reach out to me personally. We're forming a national steering committee to figure out what to do with this donation. And we really want to work with everyone on a ground level for this. Uh, it's our mission to do community driven mobility. So we want the communities to be put first. And we know that there are plenty of places in the nation that this can be used for. We hope to incorporate uh, a model that will really serve older adults and people with disabilities as part of this donation. And we're still figuring that out. But uh, we know this has a lot of potential and we really want to take the principles of our research and put that forward with this donation. So uh, again, uh, next slide, please, Carrie. Again, if you have any um, in interest in this, you have anything to say, you want to be a part of this process as we move forward, uh, I'm at Mitch at sharedmobility.org. Please feel free, reach out to me directly and we can see what we can do. Um, additionally, uh, in terms of our research report, if you are looking for the full I'll report on that with all of our recommendations and findings detailed. Um, the paper is hosted on our partner's website. So that's mobilitydevelopment.org slash NADPC. I think that was in the registration link, um, but in case anyone missed it, feel free to find it there. So uh, there's a lot of great work we're doing in this space. We want to put this stuff into action. We don't want this stuff to sit in the shelf. Um, so again, if you're interested in all any of that, please email me find our report on the link. Um, and yeah, I think we're doing questions at the end. So I'm happy to answer anything, anything about that. So thank you all very much for listening. I appreciate it again, Carrie and Steve for having, us, having me on today. Uh, thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, well done. Um, and, and Carrie, I think this is the point where I get to introduce Al. Al Benedict provides technical assistance to transit agencies through the FTA Mobility on Demand program. As part of that work, he leads the MOD Learning Center, an online resource highlighting shared mobility practices and case studies to help cities and transit agencies navigate the field of shared mobility. He's also worked on various projects to estimate the impact of shared mobility on greenhouse gas emissions, and looked at ways of estimating the de demand and market around shared mobility. He leads SUMC's efforts around accessibility issues related to shared mobility and persons with disabilities and equity considerations for providing access in underserved low-income communities. He also has expertise in geographic information systems, which you've heard as GIS and economic development. And he has a master's in geography with an emphasis in urban planning from the University of Akron, Ohio. And thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Uh, one moment. Hmm. All right. I'll get this, <laughs> bear with me. Here we go. Uh, great, well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve, and, and for, you know, it's, it's great to you know, be a part of this webinar and to co-host it with NADTC. Um, and Mitch, it was a great, great presentation. Uh, some great examples uh, around shared mobility around the country. I wanted to take what Mitch had said and kind of build off of that and, and kind of think about what would, what would it mean if all those different services were bundled up under, under one platform, the mobility, mobility as a service platform, so a user could access that, you know, the, that information and pay for that information, all sort of under one, one umbrella. So first, I just want to, just a couple, couple things about the Shared Use Mobility Center. We're a nonprofit organization. We're based out of Chicago. We have offices in, in Los Angeles and also North Carolina. We uh, we are focused on mobility on demand and shared mobility and, and what it can do to promote an equitable, sustainable uh, mobility infrastructure that's, that's accessible to, to everyone. Uh, we see you know, transit being the backbone to that. And the other modes, bike share, car share, you know, carpooling, all, all fit into that, that mobility ecosystem to, to really sort of create mobility options for, for everyone. 
Uh, we do work with the, we're the TA Center for the FTA. We, we work with their MOD uh, pilot projects, uh, the, the sandbox and, and the latest round of the IMI projects. Uh, and so we have, and, and as well as we work with the California Air Resources Board uh, on a $20 million initiative for economic investment and mobility investment in lower income communities throughout California that have also disadvantaged or poor air quality, don't meet air quality standards. So uh, kind of taking, taking what we learn in the field and kind of putting that to practice uh, with the work that we do. Um, <clears throat> so I think this, this first map is kind of, it's, it's, first of all, it fascinates me that share mobility has grown so much. You know, just if you look at just where it is across the country, it's really, really widespread. And so that's, there's that, but then secondly, just how the technology has changed over the, you know, in the, in the early, early days, uh, early 2000s of round trip car share to, you know, we saw station-based bike share, then dockless bike share, and then TNCs, and, and, and in the last couple of years, we've seen dockless uh, scooters, you know, e-scooters, and so really just this, you know, with all those mobility options, really helps to sort of, I, I think, highlight the need for sort of a mobility as a service platform where they can all be accessible and or you know integrated into to one mobility app, you know a mobility platform um, and so you know these all you know many of these these private operators are out there uh, it's a great service but they all have their their you know uh, proprietary apps and so there it's really, it makes it difficult and it poses a lot of obstacles for for consumers that are trying to plan for and pay for and coordinate trips so first off, what is mobility as a service? In its basic form, it's, a, it's an integrated platform that in a single interface allows you know, users to both plan and pay for their, their mobility, uh, you know, uh, mobility. And so center to the mobility as a service concept is this mobility operator or a broker. And the broker really acts as, as, a, as through uh, through data, data agreements and, and, and the data standard, the mobility operator is able to interface with all these different mobility options that are out there and able to help the user, you know, guide them through what is best to, to meet their needs. And it could be, you know, uh, you know physical uh, limitations, uh, a wheelchair or wheelchair accessible vehicles needed, or it could be visually impaired, impaired person that, that needs, needs, uh, needs assistance or, Perhaps extra time boarding or on, you know boarding a, a vehicle, uh, but as well as you know just other other considerations too. For example, you know cost, time, and and convenience are all things that we consider as users when we look for mobility options. And having them all central in one place, it allows the user to to make those choices in real time to to find out what mobility solution meets their needs at that given moment, and it changes from day to day. So, for example, if I'm late for a meeting, you know, in that case, time is the most important thing for me. If it's a Saturday afternoon and I have nothing to do, then, then cost is maybe my primary consideration. And that shifts with the trip purpose that, that everyone has. And the mobility as a service platform, having all that integrated into one mobility ecosystem allows that user to, to really plan for and coordinate their, their you know, mobility, their trips. So, you know, it, it is, it offers an integrated ticketing and, and, and payment um, platform. You know, there's also user profile information that is stored sort of in the back end. And so it knows if, you know, if, if you do need, you know, extra time to be loading uh, a vehicle or if, if you, if, if, a, if a particular trip qualifies for a subsidy, it, it has all that, that information kind of stored in the back end, so it can give you the, the options that really sort of suit, suit, suit your needs. Um, you know, it improves the efficiency for the whole, the whole transportation system. And, you know, and in, in turn, having this, this mobility ecosystem with all these different options really help people live, you know, um, live without a vehicle or live without a car to, you know, when they know that there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of different mobility choices uh, that they can utilize for their trips and, and, and their different needs. Um, so this slide right here kind of looks at, it's a, you know, a little different. Uh, so for example, you have, there's the transport operator and then the MAS operator and then the user. And the user really doesn't know that this MAS operator is in the middle. All the user really cares about is, is the, you know, will the, how do they get to a place? You know, how do they book? How do they pay for? 
this, these services, and the MAS operator is able to then present those options. Uh, think about you know the airline industry is a is a great example. So, you know, if you visit any of the the travel sites, Travelocity or you know, they that that happens because there's a data you know mutually mutually beneficial data exchange that happens with the airlines and they share their information. So you type in you're going to you know San Francisco, it then presents the the options that are available for you to make that trip. Uh, and and you know it's it works it works in that case and it can work for you know our mobility infrastructure that we see here as well. Again, you know it, it allows the user then to make those those decisions. What what is most important to them and what other needs are and what is most important to them at that time. Again, taken into the cost, time, and convenience of of these different options that are available. So this this is the MOS typology. It's a it's a you know it's it's one way to kind of think about where we are in the U.S. compared to international uh, you know sort of uh, uh, MOS where it is a little further developed. But we are making we are making great strides in the U.S. Uh, so zero level zero is there's there's a single you know disparate system. There's no integration, and you know that and that's many of the cities across the U.S. That's what we see. If you want to bike, if you want to get rent a bike share, you got to use a bike share app. If you want to use transit, you got to go to the transit agency. So there's really just no integration uh, between those two. Level one is there's integration and there's some price information, but you can't pay for or or book a trip. The like Google Maps is a good example of of a, of a level one where you know provides valuable information, but you know it, it doesn't allow you to actually complete that transaction. Level two, uh, and there's there's definitely examples of level two here in the U.S. with you know the transit uh, transit agencies around the country, but then also the private sector has really taken this and, and moved moved forward with it. So, for example, TNCs in many cities, you can uh, pay for your transit while using the, the app, you know, through API interface. Uh, you know, transit app, the, the actual transit app, also has uh, multimodal trip planning and payment in, in certain markets throughout the throughout the US. Level three, uh, it's, it's kind of taking that one step further. So you have building off of level two, you have that integrated system. It allows you to bundle and pay for those services under one subscription. So for example, think about your, your, your monthly transit pass that you might have. So think about if you had that month, that same monthly pass, but instead of just transit, you were able to use you know, car share and bike share, uh, you know, micro transit. So it allows, you know, you know, allows for you to plan and better manage your, your transportation expenses because you have you know a monthly flat fee you're able to to coordinate you know and 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 know when you have the mobility options to to meet your needs and then level four that's that's where there's this integration of policy at a government level that that really sort of lays out guidelines uh, and standards that both the transit agencies and the private sector need to adhere to so that that communication can occur between those those different operators and, and that sharing of the of pretty basic information actually uh, so that uh, mobility as a service can then coordinate the different mobility options uh, based on you know the availability of, of modes that are out there. So you know there's there's plenty of examples of, of international examples. Uh, maybe one of the more recognizable ones is the, the Flex Denmark program. It's uh, Flex Denmark is a is a software company uh, out of Denmark that's owned by the the five uh, regional transit agencies in in Denmark, and it's a it's a demand responsive system that uh, Denmark, you know, prior to this, they had a system that wasn't too far from from our typical NEMT services that we see here in the U.S. Uh, and then also they had bus service that that served rural and lower density areas, but they realized that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't economical to to run these services uh, in rural areas or low density areas. So, they they developed uh, these transactional data standards or standards that the different operators need to adhere to to uh, for and and so in doing so they have, have over 550 providers that sort of are in that system or in that portal under the mobility as a service um, platform. And they coordinate over 5.7 million trips annually. They have a 95% on-time performance. What makes this unique also is that it's universal in design. So you, you might find yourself, you know, in the same vehicle with an elderly person or 
the person with, that, that's in the wheelchair uh, are paired with somebody who's going to school, you know, the university. So it's, it's universal in design and it's, and given that, that transactional data, that, that, that standard that's in place, all they are able to coordinate these trips and, and jurisdictional boundaries no longer are, are an issue. So um, it's all sort of that planning happens at that, at that national level and, and the trip coordination happens at that national level. There's a, if you go to AARP's website, this is actually a slide from uh, this, this photo is from the AARP's website, but they have some great videos that, um, that kind of feature the, the Flux Danmark service. I encourage everyone to, to visit that. So what is that, that transactional data standard though? So this slide kind of shows, again, this is all kind of behind the scenes so the user doesn't really know what's happening, but uh, the client in this case, you know, they request a trip and that some basic information is shared then to a list of providers, the, the pickup, drop off address, the, the type of funding that's used, uh, any mobility aids that might be necessary. And then from that pool of providers, given they all adhere to this, this transactional data standard, anyone can really meet or serve that trip. So they really increase the, the level of mobility options for uh, persons, in, persons with disabilities uh, and, and then the elderly, as well as the general public at large. And then that trip is then assigned uh, to, to a vehicle, that trip, you know, the trip is made. Again, this is all kind of behind the scenes. The users, you know, the client is dropped off and then the billing then happens sort of on the back and it flows through the system again. And, you know, whether the person's responsible for it or the, or the insurance company or the, the, health, the human service agency, that's kind of handled, you know, all in one, all in one system, all the, all the mobility options are laid out and you know, sort of streamlining and making uh, user easier for the, for the client. Um, in many cases we've worked with, there's some examples where we've worked with uh, communities and if, you know, smaller communities where they only have maybe a, two or three uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles uh, and maybe there's language barriers in place as well. If they, if they don't have the, the, the capacity to meet those requests, then a lot of that, that burden then falls on the user then to call the next county over or to call somebody else to, to coordinate that. But under the mobility as a service platform with that, that data standard in place, you know, that it sort of, that it streamlines all that for the user and, and really provide, lays out the different mobility options that are, that meet their needs. So there are some examples in the U.S. Um, of the, you know, of, of, um, of mobility as a service. Uh, so TriMet has, has a great example. This is part of the FDA, FTA MOD Sandbox project, uh, their trip planner. And they also have a transportation wallet that I think is, is, is equally interesting. So their trip planner was really the first multimodal trip planner in the U.S. It, it combined, um, you know, TNC, it combined TNCs, uh, bike share, uh, car to go when it was available, and then transit. And so all in one place where the, the user could then, you know, coordinate and, you know, put in their destination and find out what, what modes are best suited their needs. This was all developed on an open source platform. So other communities across the country can, can learn from this and adopt, adapt, adopt and adapt <laughs> parts of it to their own community. Um, Another, another thing that Portland has, which I think is, is, is you know, really, really interesting, they, in this kind of, and if you think about the, the, the mass scale, this is moving toward level three, they have this transportation wallet for, in, in several low-income neighborhoods in, in Portland, the, uh, and partly subsidized by, by Portland, uh, you, uh, uh, residents of those neighborhoods that can, can purchase a monthly subscription and they'll have access to you know, transit and, and car to go when it was available and, and bike share. So it's kind of moving toward that subscription and it really helps these neighborhoods in particular because it has this equity focus to it, plan for and manage their expenses knowing they have sort of a one monthly sort of flat fee that they need to pay you know, for, their, for their travel needs. So another project that I think is, is also interesting. This is also a FTA sandbox MOD pilot project. Uh, Vermont was, was faced with an interesting problem. Um, so they, they, in that there was no typical trip planning soft, triple, uh, typical trip plannings or applications didn't allow for coordination across jurisdictional boundaries necessarily, or if, you know, different transit agencies or different across different services. So 
they developed this statewide trip planner that you know it combines the GTFS with its uh, GTFS is the general transit uh, feed specification with this flex component to it. And GTFS is, you know, it's just, it's a standard for re you know, reporting sort of trip, trip data. And so with that flex though, they're able, uh, users are able to coordinate across county lines. They're able to coordinate across different services such as carpool, uh, wheelchair, accessible, wheelchair accessible vehicles are also part of this. So they're able to step back and sort of plan for their trip. And Vermont, you know, when they, when they were designing this, they did have a, an inclusive planning and design process, as well as as well as Portland, to to really involve the community members, uh, uh, you know, visually impaired persons with disabilities, to to really find out what their needs were and develop a develop this this platform to assure that it was accessible to everyone. And again, this is based on that open source application as well. And other other cities across the U.S. are are also looking to this GTF, GTFS flex to, to build on their, you know, uh, to build, build trip planning uh, platforms for their own community. So this goes, this is, goes, you know, offers this trip planning stuff, but it doesn't have that, that integration of, you know, of services and allow people to actually pay for the services. So um, kind of that next level is what we're really looking to, to um, achieve here. Uh, so what are some of the steps to implementing uh, mobility as a service? First of all, having a human, you know, human design, human centered design approach, an inclusive approach to, uh, and to really understand what the needs are of the community. Uh, you know, and also the, having the standardized uh, data format or, uh, you know, in particular uh, trip planning this transactional data, data standard allows that communication to then happen among the different mobility providers without that, you know, it's it isn't a, it isn't an integrated system. It's a, a standalone system, um, and you know, and these can be done through incentives to to you know for the for the mobility operators. But on some level, you know, there's some when a lot of times when cities or transit agencies are are looking to renew their their dispatching dispatching software, this is a time to to kind of think about these transactional standards and how to work them into the, the RFPs that they might be issuing to, to renew or procure new services. That's really the, an open door to, to really think sort of, you know, how do we, how do we expand the service and how do we really sort of create an inclusive system? Uh, and that, you know, looking at the mobility assets that you have in your community and, and what would you like to include under a mass system and in building coalitions, uh, especially if you think about you know, a local project, and how do you how do you scale or build that to a region? How do you scale and build that to a state and to you know to the nation? You know, you really need to to build this this broad base of coalition support, uh, familiarize people first of all with the mass concept, but then secondly, what, you know, what the benefits are and and what what steps are needed for for implementation. Uh, the um, and then you know I think then you sort of see sort of the, the different mobility options sort of integrated into one place and and you know, with the benefit, you know, the benefits that are that are present. So the kind of going through this quickly, but the we have here, this is our uh, learning center. It's a uh, FTA funded this, it's the MOD Learning Center. And it's really aimed at a repository or clearinghouse for uh, shared mobility and mobility on demand uh, through learning modules, case studies. Uh, we have a, 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 a shared mobility calculator on there to to estimate the, the greenhouse gas emissions, to um, you know, to to summaries of different pilot projects, both accessible, you know, and throughout the U.S. So I encourage everyone to to visit, and uh, we're going to be adding another case study up there uh, early next week. That's looking at uh, uh, food delivery programs uh, for the elderly and persons with disabilities uh, uh, during you know during the this COVID pandemic, and we've seen great things with the transit agencies kind of offering these services and really and stepping up and filling needs that you know within the, within the community um, and that's it um, that's all for my slides thank you <laughs> and uh, please let me know if you have any questions and i'll stop uh, sharing my screen great thank you very much al mitch and steve we've gotten some great questions i will uh, post the question most of them i think uh, any of you are welcome to provide your feedback on. 
Uh, there are a couple that I will note uh, who it's for, but if you could just say who is speaking uh, when you start answering. We've had a couple, uh, several questions on the e-bikes. And uh, there are two related questions that I'll pose right away. Um, first of all, how useful is it to frame electric bikes as a tool for aging? While it's certainly useful for an aging population, we see electric bike use with a variety of demographics and situations. And paired with that, a few people were asking how that's gonna work in areas that are rural with limited road accessibility or places without sidewalks or bike lanes. So I will open it up to the e-questions. If anyone wants to go ahead and get started, just identify who's talking, please. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Mitch here. Uh, first, I just wanna say, Al, that was a great presentation. I know you like, uh, just wanna say that uh, before we can get into the questions, but um, <laughs> For, for in terms of e-bikes, um, at least for our project, I may have been a little uh, talking a little quick. Uh, we're not necessarily looking to use these in rural areas, um, though. If we uh, worked with a small town or a village center in a, in a rural setting, I think there is some pliability there, and we've gotten some local interest from villages who are a little farther off uh, from the Buffalo core urban area. But we're not trying to put people in a position where they're riding on roads that uh, basically can't handle a bike or they're not prepared to be on. So we're very cognizant of that. I, I don't think that's our goal is not to put people in that position. But um, to the more inclusive question about where we're looking to deploy these and, and how we can use these, I agree that e-bikes are not necessarily exclusively a tool for folks who are aging. Uh, and there definitely is a lot of pliability in their use and a lot of diverse applications in a shared setting where uh, folks in di many different communities can use these. Um, and they've been shown through other studies to help folks in disadvantaged communities, expanding options to fixed route transit and, and many other benefits for, for folks in a variety of settings. So I think that there is still a lot of great use for them for older adults and the, the AARP has even uh, profiled those, those use cases, but they're not necessarily the only use cases for them. That's what makes them so dynamic. You know, we wanna accomplish a lot of goals with this big project with these 3,000 bikes. We want to serve a lot of communities that are underserved by current mobility options. So we really like that these e-bikes give us a good amount of flexibility in that. And we think that, you know, hopefully we can design programs around the concept that, you know, we're trying to expand mobility options for everyone and uh, older adults and people with disabilities are, are certainly at the forefront of our mind, especially coming off of this research. Hi, this is Steve Yaffe. Let me add to that regarding the question of, at, of pathways in rural areas. Um, I find my, I'm living in South Carolina now where in the South you'll find many collector and arterial roads that don't have continuous pathways. Um, so advocacy is key both with your State Department of Transportation. There's lots of national resources, CompleteStreets.org, WalkAmerica.org. Um, I'm a transit guy, nobody floats to a bus stop. So as uh, the transportation reauthorization bill is supposed to expire in September, the House has passed an INVEST Act, the Senate hasn't acted on it. Uh, they may kick the can a, a, another year. Um, but advocacy to ask that paving projects include extra pavement for bike and ped is certainly a reasonable ask. So I thought I'd throw that out there, thanks. Al, did you have anything on this one that you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think, you know, I think Steve and, and Mitch really hit it, like having you know, educational programs and, and it really mobility goes hand in hand with, with you know, land use and infrastructure and, and having, you know, the proper bike lanes and everything. And that's, you know, and, and having a base and lobbying for that is, is critical. I know this may be off the subject a little bit, but I think, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a lot of uh, pop-up mobility infrastructure happen and so uh, really seemingly easy things that, that cities and cities can do to, to make it safer for people to, to, to you know walk to, to, to cycle uh, which is cones or having slow streets so and so yeah. um, but so that's but that's it but the electric bikes are fun <laughs> like a lot yeah. so yeah Thank you. And this is Carrie. I will just add that um, 
somebody else uh, mentioned the the trikes, the three wheel bikes, and that that ha gives additional stability. And there is a project in Wisconsin, Barron County, way northern northwestern Wisconsin, that is providing electric trikes to older adults, and they are using them on one of the trails um, that is happens to connect kind of the outskirts of town to one of the grocery stores that just moved out of the center of town. And that has been a really popular project because it not only gets people to the grocery store that maybe they were able to walk to before it had moved, um, but also it gives them the freedom to use um, those bikes for other purposes. And those mm -hmm. of you who may be familiar with um, the Cycling Without Age program started in Denmark. So those are electric trikes that have, or that have a place for passengers in the front. And um, with those, you know, they're larger, larger uh, bicycles that um, a lot of training for people to use the roadway to take the lane and to have proper bicycling habits are are really a good avenue for um, that education for getting people to use those bikes in an area that does not have a designated sidewalk or bike lane. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So the next question, uh, I believe, will be one primarily, let me find it here, um, for Al. Uh, where do you see the future hope of universal mobility in the US happening already? You know, there, there's, it's a good question. There's, you know, programs out there right now that, that are moving toward universal mobility. Um, in, in Kansas City, they have uh, a universal uh, accessible program that, you know, serve, offer service, serves both the, you know, the persons with disability community and elderly, but also, um, you know, the, through, through an app, you know, anyone can really access that service. Uh, you know, I think, so I think, I think we. I think we need to. I think there does need to be some intervening um, government governance, though. To and you know we're working with AARP on this this transactional data standard. You know data d demand response tran transit um, you know, uh, standards in general and and how what those can do to a community to really offer that integration to to occur. You know so there's some some basic things that need to happen. But I I do see I do see us moving towards a universal system, uh, and there's, you know, it's it's exciting to see, you know, uh, just to, to increase the mobility options for for really everyone. And it's not a this system, that system. It's one system that that everyone can access. Great, thank you. Um, this question, uh, Mitch, you had mentioned the Mile Car program. Um, is that program an example uh, that uses? cost sharing across public and private sectors to support the service? Was it hard to get buy-in from agencies, especially those public agencies to share, uh, to cost share the service? Uh, so it's not necessarily direct cost sharing, but we have subsidized the pricing through uh, support from the California Air Resources Board and uh, Department of Energy and, and those uh, con sort of uh, a consortium of sources from the public side. Uh, I think it's more of an example of a public-private partnership where uh, mobility development as a, a nonprofit slash private entity is, is working with the state of California and entities out there to make this program work. So uh, we're currently developing a standalone nonprofit for that that can help work with uh, more agencies out there. But in terms of support in that region, there's been a lot of support for that program. Um, we've had plenty of requests for folks who want to see that expanded to their communities across the valley. So uh, the, it's been an interesting model to work with. Uh, it's been definitely something that's uh, different for car sharing in general, where car sharing is usually seen in just really dense urban areas or college driven markets. So working in a rural area, having to do different outreach uh, and targeting new populations. And you know, of course, working with the cost of the program and the pricing has been very, uh, very uh, innovative, I think from our end and where we want to see car sharing going and see shared mobility become more inclusive. So um, I know it's, it's a bit of a couple different answers in, in there for that, but that's sort of the model we're working with, and it, it's still evolving as we, we go forward here. Great. Thank you, Mitch. Um, Al, can you tell us again the difference between MOS and MOD? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good. Yeah, so the they're they're very they're similar. You know, the the FTA uses MA, the mobility on demand, and um, and then MAS is and sort of uh, sort of this global um, term that's that's used. But they're they have very very you know they have very similar um, you know qualities. You know, through the the MOD program uh, for the FTA, uh, you know, there's there's pilot projects that all sort of work toward. You know, I think incre incremental steps to really having that integrated service and creating the mobility options. Um, but they're, um, you know, it's, um, but yeah, it's just, uh, I think it's, you know, they're not exactly the same, but they're, they're sort of close. <laughs> they have like, very similarities. Thank you very much. Uh, this question uh, is for Mitch. Uh, are you familiar with the transactional data specification and is this something that the projects you are working on could use to coordinate services? Uh, so I'm only a little familiar with TDS. Uh, it's not my focus of the work, but I do know it has a lot of great applications in demand response and transportation and uh, has some flexibility in that. So we're not working with that really at the moment, but you know, when we're looking at trying to coordinate services, I, I think it's something we want to consider. Um, really to Al's point, and a lot of what Al was talking about here is that the coordination and integration of these services is really key. So um, while it's not necessarily the focus point of any of the projects we're working on at the moment, it's definitely something we want to keep in mind. And, and something as we operate programs and help assist programs, any way we can get more integration between these programs and, and become more demand responsive, I think is good. So uh, sort of the answer is, is a little yes and uh, a little, little no on that one. Well, let me jump in a little bit. Uh, with transactional data specifications, one can create an electronic record for a new client at an uh, aging and disability resource center or 211 or any other information referral service, send it to a call center where they can add the ride request, um, add uh, electronic transmission, no rekeying, no errors, send that enhanced record onto a ride provider to provide the ride. If the ride provider is running late, they may swap it with another ride provider. And then uh, the information with the completed trip information goes back to the scheduling center for billing and reporting purposes. So it, it facilitates integration and uh, accurate delivery of rides. Um, not, it's, uh, on the, there's a software program, a couple of them, I think, that do it within their own universes so that they can exchange ride requests with participants. Um, it's uh, far less complicated. Right now, some uh, scheduling provi uh, software providers use app APIs. Uh, it's not quite as thorough, but it's uh, transactional data specifications is cer certainly something uh, an objective to work forward to improve our functionality. Great. So along those same lines, and I'll open this up to anybody, um, GBFS, General Bike Share Feed Specification, is looking to expand to be more uh, representative of adaptive bike share systems. What key information should be included in this extension? The, uh, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good question. You know, I think the GBFS, which is kind of the the counterpart to GTFS, so it's a, it's also kind of a, available to the public to and 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 provides a standard that that's report that information, so everyone can kind of access it and have you know has sort of the same same information moving forward. You know, in terms of you know what should be reported, that's I need I need to think about that a little bit more, but I think you know some just based some of the basic information, you know, how many how many you know bikes are available that. Are accessible to you know for uh, you know, uh, three wheel bicycles uh, where they are um, you know how often they're used um, you know these are some of that basic information will then tell you sort of where they're being used what's the, the market for them are they do you have a market for for more is there is it is there are they always sort of at capacity and they're always being checked out so I think you know it's not it's just some you know, it's, I'd love to, to sort of think about this a little bit more and, and give you, an, you know, a follow up. But you know, it's a, it's um, some of this the same sort of base, same sort of information that's reported through the GBFS system, and, and you know, just to, to really get a, a picture of how, you know, how they, how what kind of role they're serving the community. 
Yeah, and to build off what Al is saying there, and I'm not nearly as much into the, the, the data side of things as, as Al and Steve are, but uh, from a program side, you know, you, if you have a bike share program that integrates adaptive bikes, you're only going to have you know, a small handful, five or six, maybe 10, if you're a large program to integrate. And so what we found in our research and talking to folks is that from a program modeling standpoint, these devices probably won't be able to be thrown across a bike sharing system because if you have a certain cohort of users, specifically people with disabilities who need the devices, you know, it, it would be untenable to, you know, just put these devices out there. They can end up in any hub in your system anywhere, and they may actually lock out the people who need them the most. So from a logistics standpoint, from a program standpoint, it seemed based on our feedback and the programs that have done this easier to put them at one centralized location and treat it almost as a bike rental to a certain extent where folks, if they have a, mo a mobility device, they have other things with them that can be left at that central location, they can use the bike and, and return it um, and have that location be very accessible to modes for which people can get there. So transit, uh, paratransit, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, build your program around that. So adding it as an option and it, it's really logistically hard to have that across the program. From a data side though, you know, it's also important that if, if these are going to be in the feed, you know, how do we delineate that and how do we make sure that that information is still available and we know how, what kind of impact those devices are making without necessarily singling out the devices themselves uh, because you will have so few of them in your system compared to the mass of bikes. It could be easy to easier to, to track motions on who is using those devices specifically. So uh, I don't know if everyone's really asked those questions yet. I think that's a great question and a really great thought to, to jump off of with that as we look at more integration with adaptive devices in these systems. But um, just some more things to consider. It's a really interesting question, actually. I think it's a great one to, to dive into. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, here's another question are, for anybody. Are there any app software platforms that are seeking to solve integration issues by pulling in information from existing systems or all, are they all requiring migrating to an entirely new platforms? And we address that a little bit, but if, if there's a specific way we can answer that question. Got some apps such as the Transit app, they've got agreements with some payment, integrated payment systems such as Masabi um, to allow integrated payments. Uh, like Chicago, I think you can use the Venture card, which is for the transit systems to, and also on their bike share system. So it's emerging. The concern is what David Zipper calls walled gardens, where you've got a consortium and you got to use this app for, to use any of those participating providers. But if they don't, if they're not on the, uh, on the consortium, then they then you can't play with them, and we want to avoid that because we're in revolution. We're getting new providers every which way. On uh, the micro transit, the several have consolidated, renamed, and so on. For those who are brave enough to use scooters, which I'm not, um, and we really need a central playground that enables folks to op uh, provide that, and it may be that. Each municipality needs to take a lead. This is the platform we want. Please join us uh, rather than having private industry work, private agreements with certain transit systems. That's just my take. Yeah. I think that's, you know, without, you know, that's, that's right, like what Steve says, you know, without sort of a, a system in place, what it becomes is, you know, there is integration and there's definitely examples of that across the country, but it's that sort of one, you know, here and there. Uh, and, you know, not having that integration is in some levels actually creates more work for the private sector because each each new partnership where there is an integration requires sort of a new sort of, you know, learning of the how, you know, how to report that, that those data and incorporate and then the transit agency incorporate that into, you know, through APIs, uh, you know, typically now just through APIs, uh, that information or access to that information. But there's you know, it's, it's, there's definitely, you know, examples. D uh, Dallas actually has their DART transit agency has some great, their their mobile app is, is, is really good and, and integrates multiple services and also has your, you know, cross transaction. Uh-oh, Al, you froze up on us. Uh, the transactional information with, with transit agencies. There's some great examples out there of an app. Yeah. 
Oh, I did. Uh, sorry, um, I, I told my son not to play PlayStation. <laughs> so, but uh, the uh, but uh, you know there are examples out there. I think that's you know Dallas is one. I think that you know it's it's just interesting if people want to look into that further. Thank you. Um, I know we were focused more most on the shared mobility, and I know we've done other webinars and volunteer driver programs, but this is uh, related to accessibility of the shared. Um, programs and you talked a little bit about TNCs and accessibility of those but um, this question is do you have any recommendations about accessibility of volunteer driver programs for instance inclusion of wheelchair accessible vehicles and I think this would be for you Mitch yeah so um, on that you know we've worked very closely with the volunteer transportation center up in Watertown and they're sort of the preeminent volunteer transportation entity I'd say in our region. Uh, they have 300 dedicated volunteers who do 5 million passenger miles every year. So it's really incredibly scaled work over uh, a rural portion of New York State. It's about the size of the state of Connecticut. So uh, they have a lot of experience in this over the last two decades. What they found on that note is that integrating uh, a handful of wheelchair accessible vehicles into their fleet that certain volunteers drive um, has been the, the way to go. Um, and their dispatching system is uh, adjusted so that if a client has a mobility need for one of those vehicles, that that is scheduled then to be uh, sent to them as part of that trip. So um, that's kind of, it's kind of a, sort of like its own wing of the organization where the primary group of drivers drive their own vehicles. Um, and so that, but you know, it's the same reason that this doesn't really work with Uber and Lyft off the gate is that who owns a wheelchair accessible vehicle as your daily driver and no one. So you're not gonna be taking that into the program as your, your vehicle. The program itself likely has to provide those vehicles. And that's the, the challenge as well, so, you know, scaling to that point to get to a point where you can actually manage those vehicles from a, a fleet management side, where you probably don't have, because you're not a transit agency, um, to the, uh, you know, actually the capital purchases takes some time to grow. And from our Western New York mm -hmm. program, you know, that's in our long-term goals is to integrate those vehicles. but. We only have about 10 volunteers right now. So unfortunately we haven't really reached that scale and that volume to accommodate that. But we know that at some point in the future, we'd like to integrate those vehicles. So um, where the model itself is really driven on people driving their own vehicles, it's um, that's one portion of the service that the organization itself kind of needs to, to step up with and provide that service uh, as part of its suite. So um, that's the, I think the primary way we found it, you know, there's obviously more ways than, than one to do that, but, from uh, a program standpoint, we think that's probably the, the simplest option to integrate that service. Thank you. And we only have a couple minutes left, but I think this question here is really important. Um, do you know of any studies being done around the human and social impact on increased universal mobility? And this, this falls into social determinants of health. Um, and we're overseeing, at NADTC, we're overseeing some grants for both ICAM and HSRC. These are FTA-funded grants. And some of our performance measures are tied to in, uh, reduced missed appointments, increased um, access to food or, or uh, medical care. Um, this uh, developing common health transportation metrics is an effort that several organizations are involved with. And this is emerging. And um, thank you, uh, Charlotte just posted a link. To look at TCRP report H55. Um, there's, there is some research out there and, common, and performance metrics that are available and the new ones are being developed. Building off what Steve said, I, I, I won't reference any specific report, but, you know, that concept of social determinants of health, I think, is really key to think about in our work. And I think it's also important to remember that you know, transportation and mobility is a human right. And so the work we do, the work everyone here on this webinar does, and your interest in this, you know, points to that. So any way we can increase those options, I think, is good for communities. Disadvantaged communities generally suffer from lack of transportation and mobility options. So it's important and I, and on our work and Steve's work and Al's work, Carrie's and everyone here to really increase those options uh, with the goal of, of creating healthier, more sustainable communities in the end. So uh, while I don't know of any active research going on in that, I think it's really important yeah. and we should continue to focus on that moving forward. Yes, 
Thank you all for your, uh, Al, did you want to add something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, the, the work, you know, Mitch, the, the California also, but the work with the California Resources Board is really sort of, uh, there is that, that human component to it where we're serving these, the, you know, uh, looking for mobility options in in in, in low income neighborhoods. Uh, so, but it but any any time like these systems are planned, and having that involving the the community and those stakeholders in, in that process is is key. You know, it's uh, first of all by you know offers buy into the program, and, and secondly, it you know it's it's they have valuable information to <laughs> to it that, that's needed to to make it work. Absolutely. And I'm glad we ended on that note, the importance of this work and um, expanding mobility options. Thank you, Steve, Mitch, and Al for being our present presenters today. And thank you to the Shared Use Mobility Center uh, for co-sponsoring with uh, the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. This has been recording. That recording will be available uh, in a few days and will be sent along with an evaluation and the PowerPoints, including some of the links to the reports and all. So we appreciate everybody joining us and you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. This is great.